I'll tell a story my uncle told me that his coworker told him. My uncle works at a national lab, contracting, so he's not exactly employed by the government. Uncle's coworker and his superior decide to go to some old part of the site one day. They find one old shack. That's it. One old small building. They go inside. It's an elevator. Stranger Things, not JPEG. It's one long hallway with a turn at the end. In my uncle's words, you know the letter T? This hallway's got hospital-style wallpaper. Like, children's hospital-style wallpaper. My uncle's co-worker and his superior begin walking down the hallway. When they get to the turn, it gets worse. Hospital rooms with hospital beds, sized for children. As they get to the end, the rooms get worse. Cages. There are cages in the abandoned underground children's hospital. I don't know what the government was doing, but I absolutely believe my uncle and his co-worker that they were doing it. I've gotten a lot from X over the years, so I'll share a couple stories that happened to me. First one is about missing time. I am quite drunk right now, so I may overshare details. Be a teenager at the time, 2008. Death Magnetic by Metallica has just come out. Me and my best friend at the time listening to it on Windows Media Player. We vibe. I live kinda in a woods off of a highway. Lots of old trails in my area. Friend asks if I wanna go for a walk to show him the trails around my house. We're talking about horror movies and Metallica. Walking in the woods. It's 3 p.m. and he stayed the night. The trail we're walking on leads right to the local hardware store after 10 minutes of walking through the woods. There is one entrance to this trail and one exit. We walk to the end of the trail. It is 3.10 or so. We're not talking about girls talking about who's hotter in our school. We come back. My parents and his parents are calling for us. The police have been called and are searching for us. We get asked where the fuck we were. We are confused. We have been gone half an hour. I realize the sun is setting in the sky now. What the fuck? It is after 7 p.m. Neither of us have any clue what happened. We were having the same conversation the entire way. The woods around where I live are weird as fuck. Another one involving same friend. He moved around a bit in the town as his parents rented houses rather than bought one. So, be at his house. We're playing Adventure Quest on Windows XP and listening to Billy Talent. Oh my god, Adventure Quest. He asks if I want to go explore some woods. We bring our air guns as we were teenagers, and it's all we could get without a permit. We're hiking along when I notice something hung up on the tree branches. Pictures. Lots of pictures. We know all these people. Why are their photos stuck on tree branches and singed at the edges? It's their school photos. We don't really touch the pictures, just kind of look at them. All the ones that are singed have had recent injuries like broken legs or arms. We see our own photos, not touched. We take our photos and leave. Back to his house is one kilometer through the woods. Halfway to his house, we begin to realize we're being followed by someone wearing weird clothing. We never found out for sure who it was, but suspected a couple people. More people over that summer had severe injuries. One even almost died. We know it was a girl, but no idea who. She stood outside his house for a couple hours with what I assume was supposed to be a voodoo doll of my friend. I shot at her with my air gun and she never bothered us again. Weird as fuck. Not exactly X per se, but definitely odd. Be me, like 20 years old. Have this crazy kid idea that the world is grand and shit. Go hitchhiking all over the place in the Carolinas. Going down a back road near an interstate and need to find a place to camp. See a fenced off area leading back into some woods with a no trespassing sign. Huh, this looks good that JPEG. Jump the fence. Go into the woods along a rough dirt path. Start seeing signs that say like, do not go here, hazardous chemicals, and etc. A little unnerved, but keep going anyways. About a mile in, get to this random clearing with some sawdust piles. Not even sure if there was a road to get back there, or what. See a pitch black charger parked in the clearing. Immediately, hear a fucking gunshot. Nope, that JPEG. Turn the fuck around and head back to the road. Just some strange shit. 2013. I move into an apartment with my friend and some woman I don't know. She has huge tits, so it's easier to put up with her constant bullshit. This one weekend, everyone is gone and it's just me. Be in the living room playing Oblivion. 
doing the mage's guild quest line. Suddenly, I hear what sounds like everything in my friend's room be totally ransacked all at once. Then, I hear heavy steps up the stairs. Our apartment was a square and was two levels. First floor and below, where there was a closet and two bedrooms. In my friend's room, there's a locked sliding door that goes to the laundry. I think someone broke in, thinking, oh shit, since the big knife I have for protection, since no guns, is downstairs in my room. I unscrew a metal table leg and start to check the downstairs. It's small, just a square with three doorways. My room is fine. I grab my knife. Roommate's room is a mess. Shit everywhere. PC knocked over, monitor thrown on the floor, etc. Laundry door is secured from inside the room. Hear the other bedroom door shut. Run upstairs and open the door. Her room is empty. I take three steps in and the door slams behind me. I open the door and go into the bathroom, which is adjacent. In the bathroom mirror, I see what I know now to be an old hag on the ceiling of my roommate's room. Shut her door. Go back to Mage's Guild Quest because it's 2 a.m. and I don't know what else to do. Continue living in haunted apartment for the next year. Had only one strange thing happen to me in my family's house. Though my dad says he sometimes sees a shadow of someone that looks like me cross his bedroom door to the kitchen. Be me, about 15 years ago. Wake up at about 2 a.m. Go to the bathroom to take a piss. About to leave the bathroom, hear someone dragging slippers outside. Think it's mom or sister. Open door. No one. Think I was just half asleep. Next week, same shit happens. Almost shit my boxers. I am a rational and intelligent man. Pinch myself, wash face with cold water. Sound of slippers still going on outside after five minutes. I do not want to stay in the bathroom until morning. Adrenaline pumping. Open door. Nothing outside of the bathroom. Sound stops immediately. Feel like an idiot. Go to sleep. It never happened again, and my family has never heard something like it. Guess I just imagined it or something. To put you in mind of the situation I was in with this place, I couldn't leave if I wanted to. I had no car, no license. My parents' house was a hundred kilometers away, and this was the only place I could afford, as the rent was split three ways. So, on to some happenings. April, first night there, around this time actually. Have not unpacked a lot of my stuff yet, super tired. I set up my bed, an HP netbook I had at the time is sitting on a fold out camping chair because, again, that's all I could get. I go into a dead sleep, wake up at 7 a.m. in a cold sweat. Backpack I had unpacked with a bunch of clothes was now packed up again. Camping chair was knocked over, folded up. Netbook was turned off, battery removed, and cord taken out of the wall. All these things were up against the locked bedroom door, as if something was telling me to get out. Two days later, alone at the apartment for a few hours, listening to greatest hits of Pantera, listening to Walk, and it's in the chorus, but after the respect Walk, the audio goes all weird. It's just repeating, Walk, Walk, Walk. Smoke alarm starts going off in the apartment. I run upstairs. Roommate's cat is going ballistic in the living room slash kitchen area. Catch a glimpse of the cupboard doors, all slamming shut at once. Smoke alarm stops. Music goes back to normal. Cat pisses on the floor. These are all out of order mostly, just typing as they come to me. August. Different female roommate now. We all get a cat. This cat is really cute and floppy, but has an attitude. Two of us are attending school at this time, and the girl's working. Had morning classes, so I got off early and was able to go to the grocery store. Other roommate's parents came to visit. LOL. Must be nice. And I get back with my bag. My weekly budget for groceries was $20 or less. My other roommate meets me at the door. Have you seen the cat? No, I've been gone. Where was she last? She was in my room. She was sleeping, so I just closed the door and left her in there to sleep. We start searching for the cat. Check his room quite thoroughly. Check my room. Bathroom. All cabinets and cupboards and closets in the apartment. Only place left is girl's room, which has been closed since about when I went for morning classes. It is now late-ish and no cat. Decide we have to go in a room just to look because we've searched the hallways and outside. I open the bedroom door and I immediately hear a weak, muffled muse. The cat was a kitten then. 
I start looking around, trying to pin where the fuck it's coming from. It's coming from the dresser. Cat is stuffed in the top drawer of the dresser of this room that's been closed all day, severely dehydrated. Cat ends up being fine. Thought I was going crazy because it felt like all this was happening to me and no one else. Male roommate and I become quite good friends and hang out in his room playing video games. After he dies in this game, he stops and gets all quiet before saying, you ever feel like you're not alone in the apartment, even when you are? I say something along the lines of, what do you mean? He says he was taking a break from a game and just sitting there, quietly eating. Something spins his chair around so hard, the armrest snaps off. Old hag is right there and screams in his face. He falls out of the chair and is so scared he's shaking. I tell him about the before incident. Girl roommate gets a boyfriend. He's over and we're talking about Assassin's Creed. They go to bed. Next day, says he had a weird dream where he was cut up by this terrible old woman. Mentioned the hag to him. After this, things settled down for a while with the hag. And according to other people in that building, she, quote unquote, makes the rounds. Live on remote college campus in middle of nowhere. Literally just in an empty field surrounded by miles and miles of forest. Nearest store is an hour away. Usually stay at school until very late to work on projects. Unexplainable shit fairly frequently. Maybe once every month or so. Aside from seeing things in the corner of your eye, or large things moving at the edge of the forest at night, here are some things I remember. Walking home at night, and suddenly notice a second shadow walking next to my own. Turn around, and no one's there. Turn back, and the second shadow is gone. Hearing a weird roar, and seeing someone sprinting on all fours down the road, outside my dorm window. I'm pretty sure this was just a retarded spurg from the college, larving as a werewolf, but it was still weird. Hearing faint breathing following behind you. This happens so incredibly often when you're walking alone at night that it drove me crazy. Whenever you turned around, there was obviously no one there, and your breathing stopped following you until some other day. The weirdest thing of all I saw was when I was walking home from the second dorm after a party in the dead of night. I thought I saw something in the corner of my eye inside the edge of the forest, so I turned to look and see a deer standing up on its hind legs looking right at me, kind of hunched over. Maybe it was because I was drunk, but I've never seen a deer that looked like it, and the way it stood just looked unnatural. I got the fuck out of there ASAP, and whenever I walked by that specific spot again, I swore I saw things moving in the trees when I wasn't looking. Bizarre Old Town Lore In any city, in any country, there are rumors on tall tales known only to the locals. Stories too small and perhaps too esoteric to get worldwide acclaim, like the whole alligators in the sewer business. Stories too upsetting to become tourist attractions, like the tunnel people of LA or the dissectors of Old Edinburgh. You will especially know what I mean if your city has a historical old town district, like so many European urban centers do. In modernity, these monuments to the bloody, ignorant, Yet grandiose history of our predecessors are usually given a bright new coat of paint, strangled with pretty lights, and made into honey traps for loud crowds of tourists. Yet, still, the wind keeps on carrying bizarre and cryptic legends, whisperings of grotesquerie, carnage, madness, and perhaps even mysticism. Let us delight in sharing those, X. I have a bunch to tell and bump the thread with. Hopefully, so do you. My first tale comes from the city of Istanbul. I traveled there on work-related matters a few times in the past, and I just want to say that it was the first ever city that really made me think about cities as actual beings, creatures of sorts. I remember standing on the peak of a huge mountainous street, looking down at all the pretty houses, all the richness, poverty, glee, and despair, and thinking that this was Lagos once, then Byzantium, then Constantinople, then Istanbul, and it was surely a lot more, and will be a lot more in the future. This is not a collection of houses and funky streets, but instead, a stationary living being, an ancient creature whose bones remember emperors, sultans, vikings, neolithic hunter-gatherers, Greek fishermen, fascists, and untold millions of others. We humans are the blood that flows through its ever-twisting veins, 
At that moment, I felt it look back at me. This glorious, blood-soaked stone dragon. Tread lightly, little human. I have seen billions crawl and squirm and dance through my gut. You are a speck of dust. And if I crush you, nobody will ever know. You know the feeling, right? Now I feel it around every city. And generally, I prefer the forest. Anyway, that day, I stumbled into the historic Ballot District of Istanbul. It was historically known as a Jewish district, but in the 30s, they started to leave en masse, and it stood empty and ever crumbling for decades since. There, an owner of a tea house told me a tale of a pie maker who used to have a store just around the corner a long time ago. Allegedly, that man had the best pastries and ballet, so succulent and delicious you couldn't get enough, and yet charged the smallest price around. There, however, was a catch, of course. Every morning, he baked a fish hook into a single pie. Whoever was the unlucky patron that would get this pie and bite down on the hook would serve as meat for the next day's batch. Another bit of lore I brought from Turkey is the legend of the secret garbage collector society. I came to Istanbul without knowing the language or anything about their people and customs in general, and I rented an apartment in a rundown district of the city instead of a hotel room. It's way more fun to travel that way, and these actions led to me witnessing a very peculiar Turkish tradition. At certain hours of the morning, you will hear a wooden cart pulled by an old man dressed in ragged clothing. He will holler the word that sounds like Eskeci very loudly while moving his cart along a certain route that never changes from morning to morning. I still don't know what Eskeci means, but what these guys basically are, are the collectors of valuable unneeded things. People throw worn socks, unfinished meals, lighters, koof masks, old stereos and such, into the cart of the Eskichi screaming vagrant, and he will thank them with a smile, then move along. One morning, me and a neighbor who was an Arab that spoke a bit of English were smoking and chatting when an Eskichi came to our street. I ran to the old man and handed him a used lighter and a brass keyring. He tested if the lighter worked and scrubbed the keyring with his long yellow nail then nodded, satisfied, and moved along. When I came back to my Arab buddy, he said something along the lines of, You think this man is poor because he takes your garbage? No, 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 no. This man is very rich. This man is richer than you or me. This man take your garbage, go to child he keeps downstairs, and give your garbage to child. Child go to the market. Child approach rich tourist and say, Please, tourist, buy this garbage so I can buy food for my sick mama. And so the tourist buy the garbage, later to throw it out. The Eskichi man picks the garbage back up and gives it to the new child. And so, the child repeats forever. I started asking my Arab pal more info about the Eskichi man, and he shared a bit more lore. You know why Eskichi man have very strict route for his little cart? Because if he goes to another street, the local other Eskichi men will hurt him. They divided Istanbul into tiny pieces so that everyone would get a similar sized portion of it. They also divide the children they have living in their basements. If one has caught more children than others, he must give one child to the one who has no children. They meet in the night under bridges and in the streets when the fog from the Bosphorus comes to discuss their dealings. Look at their belts. They all carry crooked, sharp knives. Police do not take the knife away. Police know these men, this society, and that it's older than any police. So, the police fear the ragged men of the cart. I then asked him how he knew all that, and he said, I followed one of these men. I saw where he keeps his children, orphans, and kids of addicts, things nobody will miss. He was a really cool guy. He said that he'll return to Istanbul again when he's really, really old and ordered to die there. He hopes to dissolve in this great city, plunge himself into the Bosphorus, fall down a well, or quietly fade away in the unresearched undercity catacombs. No corpse to be found. I was really into far-right stuff as a fledging acolyte, but this guy and that magnificent city made me love my fellow man no matter the race or the creed. Here's hoping his dream will come true one day. I work in a 1,000-year-old fortress. There isn't really that many local stories. Most of the people in the connected town are not local and white flight in. It's quite rural. It is supposedly built over a cave system where the veil is thin so you can access the fairy realm. There is access to a lower segment, but it has been partially filled in, 
and you can't access it without climbing equipment. Supposedly, there are other access points into town, and we get a fair amount of ghost hunters that come and try and find it. It's in Northern England, but I don't really want to dox myself with too much info. They put some kid down the tunnels in the 1800s to try and find the exit, and he either died or went into the other room. No one ever went in after him, supposedly. Some guy found a way in, but didn't complete the ritual to summon the king who was in there, and he got scared that they were yelling at him to blow the horn. History is not bloody or anything. It was never significantly attacked. There is a prison on the grounds which is a little more recent, and was used to house military prisoners in World War I. It feels like an old church inside there, and there are a lot of religious dedications on the walls. The ghost hunters are not allowed in there. They mostly just ended up talking about generic ghost stuff. There is an old guard post built into the wall. It's partially filled in, but you can still see the outline of it if you know it's there, but it is really hard to see. One of the mystic types says he hears someone shouting attention near it. I sort of get an impression of someone saluting me as I walk past it, and I salute back. For the keep, it's 100 feet, multi-floor. The ground and first floor are normal. The ground floor is where the undercraft area is. That isn't accessible anymore. The first floor is a reception room of sorts. The second floor is something a little different. As you crest the stairs and turn into the room, you are drawn to a side room diagonal to where you are facing. Every time, shivers run up my spine. I've had people come to me and comment about it. Some say they feel someone behind them in that room, or see a glimpse of something. Sometimes, I stop and just look at the doorway. It just does not feel pleasant. One of the regular mystics says there is a man in noble robes in there, and that's what a few just regular visitors have reported seeing. Personally, I have seen just a fleeting glimpse of someone going down the stairs from the roof into that room, but I'm the only person inside. The room beyond the door is something like a small storage room with a small window. Dogs regularly piss themselves in that room. Some of it is just marking territory where another has pissed, but it gets cleaned and they keep doing it. It's pretty much an open secret that certain historic buildings in old French cities, like Montauban, are built on top of a shared tunnel network. Most historians believe these tunnels were constructed in the 1600s by persecuted Huguenots a branch of Christianity despised by French rulers of the time. Some of these tunnel networks were quite functioning still in the 1940s, when they were used by the French resistance, as well as the hiding Jewish demographic during the Nazi occupation. In our modern era of safety first, some of these tunnel networks were collapsed by the authorities with much public fanfare, and others made into museums of sorts, guarded and constantly filmed by security cams. However, as a wise acolyte might guess, this was done solely with the tunnels that were accessible by civilians. The ones still in use, be it by the French officials or by alleged third parties, are still perfectly functional. More so, during certain long-forgotten holidays of the early European pagan kind, some of these surviving tunnel networks are said to really come alive. Those who have the pleasure of living in old townhouses swear they hear footsteps under their floors or in their unusually thick red brick walls. Homeless and stragglers sometimes report seeing torch flames and bizarrely dressed figures in the night, marching off to somewhere under the streets, visible for brief moments through secluded iron storm drains that lead to the underground. Screams are sometimes heard during such furtive festivities as are moans of pleasure and the gnashing of teeth. Of course, this is all just hearsay and proper, skeptical, rational individuals pay these rumors no attention. For example, the local police never check these alleged sightings and sounds, despite receiving distressed calls from locals annually. I mean, if the police think it's all in their heads, who are we to say otherwise? In USSR, so-called scientific atheism was the general state ideology, and most religious practices were banned, while the few remaining were in the pocket of the KGB and only allowed to exist because they were a very helpful tool of investigation and persecution. Since most Orthodox priests recorded all seemingly private confessions of their flocks and gave them away to the government in return for the right to continue their, sometimes, rather bohemian lifestyles. After all, while most Soviet citizens were happy to get a chance to buy any kind of fruit in the winter, including simple things like apples, Russian Orthodox priests 
enjoyed pineapples and even the rare and sought after bananas all year long. Not to mention all the wine and chocolate they were granted. In Old Petersburg, as the story goes, there was a particularly despicable orthodox clergyman. Not a mere cowardly gluttonous informant for the secret service, but an actual KGB major undercover. Living in the historic part of the then Leningrad, he owned a luxury flat just a few meters away from the place Dantievsky met his demise nearly a century before. One day, he was having a party that happens not in a club or a cafe, but one's apartment living room, eating fruit and caviar with his work buddies from the KGB, dancing with easy women one of them brought to the officially banned sounds of enemy foreign music, such as the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. That night, there were more men than ladies at the party, and when all the guests began a slow dance to some Western banger, the clergyman was left without a pair. As a joke, he then opened his closet and took out an antique hand-painted icon of St. Olga. He laughed. If I can't dance with any of you girls, maybe I will dance with St. Olga here. And he began comically twirling and spinning with the holy icon in his hands. Everyone started laughing because this passed his humor back in the day. The laughing ceased once the clergyman froze all of a sudden. He just stopped, mid-twirl, clutching the icon in his hands. They say he was akin to a marble statue, only breathing, sweating profusely, and then crying. No medic, not even the inner communist party medics, were able to make him put his hands down, let go of the holy icon of St. Olga, or unbend his feet. With fear in their eyes, one of the doctors uttered, he is alive. I hear a heartbeat, but this spasm that paralyzed him, that's rigor mortis. The man was a true professional, for he made the right call. For the next week, Major Orthodox laid in his bed, still in the dancing position that he had at the moment of paralysis, and slowly rotted like a corpse left out to the elements. His heart was beating and he was breathing, even when his yellowed, folded eyes collapsed on themselves and turned to mush in his skull. He kept living as the flies left their larva under his swollen bluish skin. Maybe he is living and feeling the agony of it all, even now, 40 plus years later, in his dank grave. At least, that's what the locals tell. Wishful thinking, if you ask me. A wise acolyte knows that KGB core of the Russian Orthodoxy survived to modern day. Just look at their current patriarch. In pre-Victorian and Victorian UK, medical science, and especially anatomy, were evolving rather quickly. Each decade of the era brought a new breakthrough that modern medicine could never be born without. Among other things, anesthetics, potent painkillers, primitive antibiotics, and germ killers like carbolic acid were discovered, and general insight into how our meat bodies function grew with every year. However, the young and daring scientists of the day had a huge problem. You needed to dissect bodies to find out how they worked. However, corpse dissection, even during the most liberal part of the Victorian area, was very nearly forbidden, and in 1700s, it was very nearly impossible. You could only dissect corpses of the lower classes, going through all manner of hurdles and loopholes to get your hands even on them. Plus, since there was no refrigeration to speak of, you needed to get through those hurdles rather quickly, or the flesh of your subject withers. Despite the fact, the famed William Hunter managed to dissect several dozen dead pregnant girls and their fetuses at all stages of development. As a result, he has created a number of amazing sketches, pick related, that almost look like photographs. It's hard to overstate how important this series of sketches was for the development of medicine, for childbirth practices, and child health in general. And he did this completely legally, getting pregnant lady corpses that died natural deaths and were freely given to science post-mortem. Only in 2010, a certain Don Shelton studied the archives of Old Glasgow and Old Edinburgh, where these dissections mainly took place. Turns out that in the time period during which Hunter and his associates dissected nearly 50 pregnant girls, only 12 pregnant girls were reported dead and given to science officially. Who were the other 38? And at which state of their forced pregnancy were they allowed to know what fate awaits them at the dissection table? Another amazing story from Old Edinburgh concerns Nick Cage lookalike, 
William Ernest Henley, a Victorian poet of great talent who spent three years in the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, known for its scientific breakthroughs that made patient survivability during intrusive operations skyrocket, as well as for its shady dealings with body snatchers and all manner of seemingly occult practices that are still whispered about to this day. As a result of his three-year-long stay in the famed infirmary, Henley created a masterpiece work of poetry that he called In Hospital. Seriously, X, if you like poetry even a little, it's a must-read. Operation, clinical, and of course, discharge are beautiful works of art. You are carried in a basket, like a carcass from the shambles, to the theater, a cockpit, where they stretch you out on a table. Then they bid you close your eyelids and they mask you with a napkin, and the anesthetic reaches, hot and subtle, through your being, and you gasp and reel and shudder in a rushing, swaying rapture while the voices at your elbow fade, receding, fainter, farther. <laughs>